Hey guys, I'm Will Brantley, editor of Realtree.com. Today we're going to talk about field dressing deer and specifically seven things you shouldn't do before, during, and after you field dress a deer. So, you know, the, the topic of field dressing is one of those things you get a bunch of experienced deer hunters in a room or around a campfire or whatever um, talking about the best way uh, to field dress a deer or not to field dress a deer. You're gonna have those guys arguing. And you know, over the years, I've written a lot of articles about field dressing. I've filmed a lot of short, you know, how-to videos. And I, I don't know that there's any subject that gets uh, you know, commentators more riled up than than that one. People will uh, you know, get pretty passionate about, you know, you're not doing that right, you're not making this cut correctly. And so I'm sure we'll have some of that here. Um, but I have field dressed a lot of deer and and have seen uh the job messed up plenty of times. It's one of those things that Every hunter needs to know how to do it. It's not hard. Uh, there's not really a wrong way to do it. You can mess a few things up, but but the things that, that you don't wanna do don't necessarily have so much to do with the field dressing process, so much as the things that happen before and maybe after that process. So that's what we're gonna get into here today. The very first one that I wanna talk about, probably the worst sin that you can make uh, in field dressing a deer uh, is leaving a deer overnight. And you know, I know we all, um, you know, uh, not every shot goes as planned. Um, things have definitely happened to me that, that if you hunt long enough, they're going to happen to you and you, you're going to have to leave a deer overnight. And you've heard the phrase, you know, when in doubt, back out. And that can indeed be the best thing to do if you know you've hit a deer through the liver, through the guts. You've got to give that deer time to die or you're not going to recover it at all. But the reality of things uh, are is that during the early bow season and, and really even, even through most of the regular deer season, if you leave a deer overnight and he dies pretty early in the night, you're going to have some spoilage on that deer the next day. And the reason is, you know, you got to think about the inside of a deer's body cavity is, I don't know exactly what the temperature is, but it's around 100 degrees. And then a deer is insulated on all sides by a fur coat, essentially. And when that deer dies, the bacteria are still alive uh, in those internal organs, and those organs are up against... Uh, they're up against the tenderloin, they're up against the back strap, um, they're, they're against the interior of the hams. All the parts of the deer that you like to eat are going to be in pretty close contact to those internal organs. And a lot of times those organs, it can be a 20 degree night, you open that deer up the next morning and he's still pretty warm on the inside. And so getting those guts out of a deer quickly, really regardless of how good your field dressing job is, that's, that's the number one thing to keep in mind. And so anytime that you've got to back out uh, and and risk leaving that deer overnight. That's something that that you really need to take into consideration. Is you, you know you, you may not lose the whole deer, but you are probably going to have some spoilage just from leaving those guts inside the animal. That's just the reality. It's the way things are. Um, the second uh, field dressing sin that I you know that I would refer to really goes along with the first one, and that's that's kind of what I call lollygagging and. You see this a little bit, uh, you know, I, I see it as somebody who's been in, uh, you know, hunting media for a long time. Somebody shoots a deer, they want to clean it up, they want to get nice photos of it, they want to do an interview with it, and they don't want to field dress the deer because they don't want that big bloody hole in the middle of the deer, you know, messing up their, their photo. And You know, definitely um, a deer that's, that's fully intact and, and, you know, and loose. Um, they do look the best in photos, no doubt about it. And if I can get that photo myself as somebody who is using those photos on Realtree.com or maybe selling them to magazines, yeah, that's the photo that I want to get. Um, but I've never looked at a picture of somebody holding up a deer for a hero shot that had been field dressed and thought, man, that, that picture would look a lot better if the guts were still in that deer. On the contrary, when I see that kind of picture, I see uh, a hunter that I know has put the priority on making sure that that venison is in good shape, on making sure that that deer has started the process of cooling, on making sure that they're doing everything they can to keep any spoilage from happening. And so, you know, when you shoot that deer, have your phone, have your camera handy, you know, have some buddies take some, pic some quick pictures of it. Don't load that deer up in your truck and go driving it around and showing it off and, and you know, loading it in and out and planning photo shoots. Get the guts out of it quickly. You owe it to the animal. You owe it to yourself to have the good venison afterward to get the guts out of there and start that process of getting it cooled down. Um, the uh, the next sin is is one that I I, I say a sin with uh, with air quotes and that's busting the guts and that's one of those things you know when I've done 
uh, field dressing demos and things in the past. And definitely, you know, you're standing there, you're, you're gutting a, a deer with your buddies and you're, you're cutting it open and man, you, you, you hit, hit that gut and you get that hiss that we all dread, you know, and that, that smell of deer fart right in your face. And, you know, it's nasty and, and you, there's some people that'll swear that, man, you've busted the guts and you've gotten that stuff all over the meat and the, and the meat is ruined. Um, actually, I just put that one in the list of sins because it's just kind of a good talking point. If you nick the stomach and let that air out of there, you know, first of all, that air is caused by the, the anaerobic bacteria in that stomach and they are causing those gases to expand. And that's gonna happen really just as soon as that deer hits the ground and it's dead. And that's another reason why you wanna get those guts out quickly. The longer that that, that that deer lays there, the more gas builds up, the bigger that that deer's stomach gets. And that's why, you know, you see a deer dead on the side of the road, its stomach is all bloated and its legs are sticking up off the ground. It's full of that gas. And so when you're gutting a deer, um, you can be the, you know, a surgical uh, field dresser. And even so, every now and then you might nick that stomach if it's just bulging with that gas. And actually, one of the things that I've seen a lot of Western hunting guides do, particularly when, you know, dressing big animals like elk and moose, you know, those guts, that's a lot of bacteria inside a moose's stomach. And those, those stomach cavities can get so big that it actually makes it hard to, to get into the cavity, to work around the diaphragm and things like that. And so I've seen a lot of Western guys and it's something I've, I've even done myself a few times. You know, they, they've got a bloated stomach on an animal. They've got the, they've got the, the stomach cut open before they're going to get in there and start trying to do the diaphragm and stuff and risk busting that stomach to where the stomach matter goes inside the, the animal then get on the outside, just get on a low spot on that stomach, take a little knife, and just make a pinprick into that into that stomach and let that gas out in a way that it gets away from the animal, lowers that chest cavity down. It makes it a lot easier to work with. And that's a that's a pretty good trick. You know, if you do have a deer that you've let lay for a little while, you know, from from you know, due to a delay in recovering it or whatever, that's something you can do and and control, you know, where that gas is released rather than having that nasty surprise when you're up there working in that deer. So um, the next one, and this is something that you know, most of your experienced deer hunters know to, to do this, but I, I've seen it happen, you know, in during my time as a, you know, as a hunting outfitter and as someone who's, who's taken a lot of, of, of new hunters. Um, you know, it's pretty easy when you're field dressing a deer to get that digestive tract, the lower, you know, kind of, I call it the lower guts out of the, out of the system. And that's, that's your liver, that's your stomach, your kidneys, your intestine, the stuff kind of below the deer's diaphragm. It's easy to get that stuff out of the chest cavity and actually at a glance think that you're done. But when you look at a deer, obviously there is the diaphragm muscle, which is on the, you know, about the center of the rib cage, just above the, you know, the split of the sternum. It's right there on us and it's, it's the same spot on a deer. And above that diaphragm muscle, that's where you're gonna find the, uh, the pulmonary system, the respiratory system, your heart, your lungs, your trachea, those big arteries. Those things have to be cut out of the deer too. And so, um, one thing that, that you definitely want to do uh, when you when you open the deer's stomach, when you open its chest cavity, I, I kind of like to lay the guts, you know, the, the lower guts, the digestive tract sort of to the side so that I can see then the diaphragm muscle. And then I just take my knife, I cut around the rib cage on both sides, lower that diaphragm muscle, and then I reach way up into the deer's throat. I get a hold of the esophagus. It's a real rigid kind of pipe-like muscle, almost feels like a, a like a culvert. Um, it's about that big around. You can get a hold of that up there in the deer's throat and you can pull that. It's, it's, it's really tough. It's one of those things it's hard to pull out physically with your hand, but you can get your knife blade up there, cut that free. And then by holding that esophagus, by making sure that your diaphragm muscle has been cut out, you can actually pull that whole entire gut pile out of the deer in one fell swoop and it comes out all in the, in the, and it's pretty clean. And so making sure you cut that diaphragm muscle and that you get all the cuts in place, you know, again, the diaphragm muscle, the esophagus, that will, you know, getting those cuts in place before you start pulling stuff out of there, that makes the whole field dressing process a whole lot cleaner. Now, as we're, as we're talking about making that initial incision, you know, um, different people start by, by field dressing a deer, you know, at different points. I usually, um, you know, I, I kind of classify my field dressing procedure in, into one of two things. If it's a deer that I'm not going to have taxidermy, you know, let's say it's a doe or a smaller buck, um, and, and I'm not saving the cape off of that deer, what I'm going to do most of the time, I'm going to start out with a very small uh, scalpel blade knife. I, this one, I used it last fall and it's, it's actually 
kind of gross because I haven't cleaned it, done a good job cleaning it up. But one of these, um, you know, a little Havilon, something like that, where you can replace that scalpel light blade. I will bunch up some fur on that deer's belly, make a little incision, and then I actually take my knife, I, I take my fingers under that skin, and I take my knife just like that and run it right up that incision. And I, I keep that hide pulled up away from the stomach, and I keep my knife blade edge pointed up and that keeps me from puncturing that stomach at a time again where I don't want to puncture it and it keeps me from really getting down into the guts and so I lay that skin open uh, on a buck that I'm going to taxidermy I cut up to the very base of the sternum and then right there I stop because I'm going to need all of that that hide around that deer's chest later on to cape him out but for a doe I'll cut that skin all the way up to the base of the throat and then the one time that I will use uh, a larger knife in the field. I might use one for a shore, you know, cutting shooting lanes or something. But if I'm going to finish field dressing a doe or again a small buck or something that I'm not going to have mounted, I do like to have a big, heavy fixed blade knife with a good spine on the back of it. Um, I'm not a knife blade knife design expert, so I, I think this one is uh, is like a you know a standard skinning blade basically. But I like that I like that heavy spine on the back of that because I can get that underneath that rib cage and actually use it in a levering motion and you can pop those ribs right apart from the sternum all the way up to that deer's uh, to the base of that deer's neck and then you've got a full open chest cavity to work with you can reach that esophagus and the diaphragm we talked about earlier and you can just pull that stuff out of there in kind of one clean motion um, after uh, you know after that one um, you know, once you once you clean all those, you know, all those guts out of the deer, there is a, you know, there is a step. I say, hey, you got to be sure you remember to, to, to clean the exit ramp out. And, you know, the down in the deer's pelvis at the base of the tail, the lower colon and all of that, if you're not going to get your deer quartered right away, um, it's pretty hard to get that stuff out of the deer with that initial cut where you're, you're pulling the whole gut pile out. So you got to remember... Um, either go in at the at the base of the deer's tail. I, I tell my little boy, you know, he's nine years old. I'm like, hey, buddy, we gotta we gotta cut out the butthole, and uh, and that's just part of it. You gotta cut a circle around that, and use again, like I'm using that little precise scalpel blade to do that, and to to get up in there and cut that circle around that, and then um, I'm coming in above the pelvis and and cutting that loose from the you know from anywhere that's attached inside the deer. And then I try to pull that out in one chunk. And you know, you gotta be careful. You need to watch for the bladder and things in there. A lot of people will freak out if they, you know, if they pop the bladder and they, they get deer pee on their hands. It's not gonna hurt anything. Um, you can wash it off, it'll be just fine. And for the most part, like the any any of the stuff that you're gonna get that deer pee on, you're probably gonna be trimming most of that away anyway, because it is right there at the base of the hip. So um it's best not to get it on there, but, you know, I think people make too big of a deal about, oh, I've gotten, you know, I, I spilled gut or I spilled pee on, you know, on part of this deer meat. It's not going to ruin your deer meat in the long run. Uh, letting your deer meat spoil, um, not getting it clean quickly, not aging it quickly, that will ruin your deer meat. Getting a little pee on it and, and having to trim that part off later is not that big of a deal. So, um, uh, we mentioned earlier about deer that we're going to cape versus uh versus deer that we're not you know and, and splitting that sternum all the way up um you know as an outfitter i end up caping a lot of deer a lot of people want to take it home have a shoulder mount made of it and it's very easy while you're field dressing to kind of you know lose your train of thought so to speak and and you know if you've been shooting a bunch of does that season or whatever and you've been field dressing them by splitting the sternum it's pretty easy to forget what you're doing for a moment and and you know split the sternum on a, on a big buck too your taxidermist can maybe fix that, but you got to remember if you split, uh, you know, a deer's chest, um, you know, up to his brisket, basically, that's the forward-facing part of your shoulder mount, and so you really want to be careful about not doing that. And so, um, what you want to do on a buck that you're going to have mounted, like I say, basically come up to that V of the sternum, and you can feel it in your own rib cage, and you can feel it just plain as day on a deer too, and stop your cut right there. Come around, that's that's right at the edge of where you're going to see the diaphragm. Cut that diaphragm, and then you're just going to have to reach up in under that rib cage, get a hold of that esophagus, and cut it out. And uh, and that'll save you plenty of good hide to, to have that case. And so those are the those are the the kind of the seven deadly sins that I talk about uh, in regards to field dressing. They're, they're the mistakes that I see people make. And they're not the ones that people 
tend to freak out about a whole lot over field dressing. Like I say, everybody worries about busting guts and, and busting bladders, and none of that's ideal. But I'd a whole lot rather do that on a deer that I'm taking care of quickly than on a deer that I had to leave overnight, and I know the guts are going to be swollen and that, you know, and that decomposition is starting. And to kind of throw in a, a bonus tip, a, a number eight tip that, you know, that wasn't in the story that we shared on Realtree.com about this, um, I've actually gotten to the point where, uh, for, for my own purposes, I, I don't field dress a lot of my deer at all. I, I keep a tarp with me in my pack, and I lay it down right there in the woods, and, uh, and I quarter my deer out right there where they are. Um, we're, we live in a world now where um, loading a deer up in the bed of your truck and driving it to the processor and to show your buddies and things, it may not always be legal now because of transportation regulations due to chronic wasting disease. Um, you certainly, in almost no cases, can take a whole deer across state lines. And so, you know, it, it's been a part of the Western hunting culture for years to know how to, to take an antelope, an elk, a mule deer apart in the field, put it in a pack and carry it out. And um, it, it's slowly catching on in the whitetail world too. And I, what I found personally is that um, I can have a deer skin and quartered and in meat bags, um, you know, in not a whole lot more time than it takes me to field dress one. Once I once you kind of get your process down, once you know where the ball and sockets are on the on the different quarters, and it's it's I can certainly have one in a cooler faster that way than by field dressing it, then dragging it out, then loading it up, then taking it home and hanging it and skinning it that way. It's not always as comfortable squatted down out there in the woods, but it is a it is a good way to do it, and it's certainly the best way to get your meat off the bone and chilled quickly and uh, and again like in our age of cwd it's one of those skills that everybody you know every deer hunter needs to learn how to do now i would say that with the you know with the disclaimer that you need to be sure that that's legal in your state um, some states are going to require proof of sex so you, you know if you've got a buck you might have to leave his testicles attached to you know to a portion of the deer ham or whatever um, be sure you're following the regulations for your state but it is a very useful skill to learn. And so, you know, just as a final note, we've kind of gone over my knives a little bit. Um, you've got the rubber gloves and the, and the wet wipes. And, you know, when I was a kid, I might have made fun of somebody for, for packing rubber gloves out there and wearing them while field dressing. But, um, you know, the reality is, uh, particularly if you're quartering a deer way out there in the field, it might be a long time before you get to a water hole where you can wash your hands off. And, and if I've got a, you know, got a nice buck or whatever, uh, I don't necessarily want bloody handprints and, and pieces of meat stuck all over the antlers and you know don't necessarily want to be driving my nice pickup truck with blood and stuff stuck all over my hands so it's pretty easy to stick a set of rubber gloves in my pack put those on take care of the work and then take them off and my hands are pretty clean i'm not soiling up everything i touch i'm not getting blood all over my bow when i'm carrying it out and then a pack of wet wipes goes a long way too to again like cleaning your hands up and also wiping the deer's face off we talked about those good photos earlier you know cleaning up the blood around the nose and the eyes so you get a nice picture of it a nice tasteful picture so uh other than that you don't need much in your kit to field dress a deer you just need to uh do it right and do it quickly and uh those are your uh your seven field dressing sins i'm sure you have some more if you're uh watching this so i'd love to see what you have to say chime in in the comments